No matter how you've come across this tape or CD, please listen to it all the way through. It could change your life. Three of the greatest questions, maybe the deepest questions we can ever ask ourselves are these. Where did we come from? Where do we go when we die? What is the meaning of life, the purpose to it all? I'm sure most, if not all of us, have asked these questions outwardly or inwardly at some point in our lives. Maybe we don't like to admit it for whatever reason. You may have had some time driving or sitting alone and try to think these things through. Life is full of twists and turns. You never know what's around the corner. But is life just about education? Buying a house, earning money to pay the bills, getting married and raising a family? Then we die? Is that it? Isn't life deeper than that? Isn't there more to it? Did this whole complex universe, full of laws governing the planet, your body which is so intricate in every detail, just happen by accident and chance billions of years ago? Is everything we see accidental? To believe that takes some faith. Or is there a creator, a designer that created everything we see and one day we shall have to stand before him and answer to him? So where can we go to find absolute truth? Answers to the questions that we've already raised. Who or what can we really trust in, in this life? Everybody has different ideas, opinions and ideals. But who is right? No matter what you have heard or what has ever been said, know this. There is no book like the Bible. Written over a period of 1600 years, penned by over 40 different people, there is not one error or contradiction in the Bible. The Word of God. And when I say the Bible, I mean the authorised version. Not a modern translation. There isn't one error, no matter what you have heard. Why? Because this book, authored by God, the Holy Scriptures, authored by God and written by a man, has been preserved perfect by God himself, from generation to generation. Now the Bible stands alone compared to any book, because it is the only book in the world that has been and is 100% accurate on fulfilling its prophecies. No other book dare do what the Bible does. You know, the Bible is the best-selling book of all time. That means more copies of the Bible have been sold and distributed than any other book ever. And yet today, it is probably, sadly to say, the least read. God has only ever written one book, the Bible. By the way, listener, have you read it? When I say prophecy, what do I mean? Prophecy means to foretell, before and to tell. This ought to be written prophecy, a foretelling, prediction, a declaration of something to come. Prophecies such as these recorded in the scriptures, Christ's birth. This was prophesied over 700 years before Jesus Christ set foot on earth, stating that he would be born in Bethlehem. Micah the prophet in chapter 5 verse 2 stated that. The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53 told us how the Messiah would suffer and die on our behalf over 700 years before Jesus showed up. King David in Psalm 22 prophesied the actual words Jesus would say on the cross of Calvary as he was dying. David gave us other specific prophecies that it would be absolutely impossible for any human to know in detail what was going to happen to the Lord Jesus Christ without God revealing it to that individual. You want proof of the authority of the Bible, the Scriptures. Prophecy is the proof. Listen to just a few other prophecies. We are told the Lord Jesus Christ would be betrayed by a friend in Psalm 41 verse 9. It was fulfilled in Luke 22 verse 21. We are told the actual amount he would be betrayed for, i.e. 30 pieces of silver, in Zechariah 11, verse 12. Zechariah prophesied that 500 years before Jesus Christ set foot on earth, 
and yet it was still fulfilled perfectly in Matthew 26 verse 15. We are even told that the money used to betray Jesus would be cast down onto the floor in the temple and not accepted in Zechariah 11 verse 13. It was fulfilled in Matthew 27 verse 5. There are many, many, many more that we just can't go into because of time. But if you want a list of all of them, call me or write to me and I'll send you it. No other holy book in the world dare do what the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, the Word of God does. The Bible is unique. It stands alone against all others. Now there are 25 specific predictions made by the Old Testament prophets bearing on the betrayal trial, death and burial of Jesus Christ. These were uttered by different prophets during the period from BC 1000 to BC 500. Yet they were all, all literally fulfilled in 24 hours in one person. I'm told, not being a mathematician, but according to the law of compound probabilities, there was one chance in 33 million that these 25 predictions would be fulfilled as prophesied. It is a fact that there were 109 predictions literally fulfilled at Christ's first coming. Apply the law of compound probabilities to this number and the chance would be one in billions that they would all be fulfilled. What other book on earth dare do that? So you can see right from the start that the Bible is God's book and it is different from any other book of any other religion. So back to our three questions. Where did we come from? Where do we go when we die? And what is the meaning of life, the purpose to it all? Where did we come from? How did the human race get here? This is probably one of the most controversial subjects on the planet. Evolutionists and creationists have been battling this argument out for years. Without going into much detail or depth again, because I only have the time on this tape to speak to you, I would like to state the following important points why evolution is totally wrong and unscientific, even though, unfortunately, most of the world has been conned and deceived by this theory. And it is just that, a theory. Evolution really is a religion. I like what one creationist said once regarding the theory of evolution. Hydrogen is a colourless, odourless gas which, given enough time, turns into people. Evolution is a lie because there are no transitional fossils. Evolutionists seem to know everything about the missing link except that it's missing. The fossil record of one animal halfway through turning into another one is one of the greatest arguments against evolution. There are no transitional fossils found for any of the following. Single cells turning into invertebrates. Invertebrates turning into fish. Fish to amphibians, amphibians to reptiles, reptiles to birds or mammals, land animals to sea mammals, non-flying mammals to bats, nor apes to humans. Not one, not one fossil, transitional fossil has ever been found of an animal in the half stage or transitional period. Now folks, that speaks volumes to an honest man or woman. There are no transitional fossils because evolution is a lie and if you believe it you have been deceived like so many others. Why have they never why have they never found one? Out of all the billions of people that have ever lived, they have never found one single human, ape or monkey in the half stage. Why? Because evolution is a lie. If you know somebody who believes in evolution, ask them these few questions and then watch the colour drain from their face. Where did space for the universe come from? Where did matter come from? Where did gravity come from? Where did the energy come from to begin the organising? When, where, why and how did life come from dead matter? When, where, why and how did life learn to reproduce itself? 
How can everything come from nothing? If you're an honest person listening to this tape or CD and you are open-minded, you know evolution just does not make sense when you really look at it. The Bible says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt, they have done abominable works. Psalm 14 verse 1 so whether you are a professor at Oxford University leading the field in evolution and spreading this lie across the world the Bible says you are a fool to say that there is no God in Romans 3 4 it says let God be true but every man a liar the first verse in the Bible says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth Genesis 1 verse 1 God created the heaven and the earth. In Acts 17 verse 24, it says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And another verse I just want to give you regarding creation and evolution is Hebrews 11 verse 3. Through faith, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. You see, God is a creator. God created everything. In Genesis 1.27 it says, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So the Bible clearly states that Almighty God, the Creator, created everything. For a detailed account of how he did this, read the first three chapters of Genesis, the first book in the Bible. So the answer to our first question, where did we come from, is God created mankind, God created everything, evolution had absolutely nothing to do with anything. Because God created us, we are responsible to him and we will answer to him. The Bible says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Hebrews 9.27 This leads us on to our next question. Where do we go when we die? The scripture we just read said that after we die there is a judgment. You and I will one day stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and be judged. Now there are two main judgments spoken about in the Bible. The first one is called the judgment seat of Christ. The second one is called the great white throne judgment. The judgment seat of Christ is the judgment where all the Christians that have put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation will receive their rewards. This judgment is not about all the sins we have committed because the judgment for our sin as a Christian took place on the cross of Calvary. Christ took our sins upon himself and died in our place. He was judged in our place. We'll talk about that in a little, in a little while. The great white throne judgment is where everyone who has rejected the way of God and has gone their own way through this life will stand before God and be judged for every single sin they have ever committed. Listen to these following verses. Revelation 20, verse 11 to 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life 
was cast into the lake of fire. Now imagine for a moment that the moment you came into this world there was a camera on you which recorded every second of your life. This camera was also able to record every word you ever said and every thought you have ever had. Now imagine that. Now the entire film of your life is going to be played in front of every single person that has ever lived. I don't know about you, but I certainly wouldn't want to be at that showing. Now this may sound a little far-fetched, but some, something like it will take place at the judgment, on the judgment day before God. But a billion times worse. The only way you can miss having your film shown is by wiping that tape clean, i.e. getting rid of all your sins before you die or before Christ comes back, whichever comes first. There is only one of two places you can go when you die, heaven or hell. There is no such thing as an in-between stage, purgatory or something similar. Purgatory is a man-made doctrine brought into being by Pope Gregory in 539 AD. It's man-made. It is not mentioned in the Bible. Depending upon what you do with the Lord Jesus Christ depends where you will spend eternity. Now listen to these following verses very carefully, please. I've often been told that the Bible is too difficult to understand. Well, the following scripture, which contains just 19 words, are all only one-syllable words. Listen carefully. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5 verse 12. In other words, if you do not have the Son of God in your life, if, and we'll talk about this in a, in a bit, in a deeper way, but if you do not have the Son of God in your life, you have not life. 1 John 5.11 says this, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. John 3.16, the most famous verse in all Scripture, says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loves us so much, folks. 1 John 4 verse 9 says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. You see, because you and I are sinners, we have all sinned and done wrong so many times against God and each other, if we're honest. Jesus Christ left heaven, came to earth, to take our sin upon himself, die and be judged in our place. In 2 Corinthians 5.21 it says, For he hath made him, that's God made Jesus to be sin for us, who knew no sin, Jesus knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's how much God the Father loved us, and how much God the Son loved us. We bring, we bring God our sins and say, Lord, we are sinners. He says, take the righteousness of my Son, he'll die in your place. He loved us so much, folks. 1 John 3 verse 5 says, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. The Lord Jesus Christ never did anything wrong in thoughts, words, or deeds. He was 100% pure, he was 100% perfect. So we bring him our sin, and he gives us his righteousness, and God sees us through him. So Jesus loved us so much, that he willingly came and died for you and for me. And three days later he arose from the dead, victorious over death, hell and Satan. The gospel is this. We are sinners. We're all sinners. We've all done wrong. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Death is a result of sin. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We need a Saviour. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ 
the Lord, Luke 2, 11. And folks, we cannot save ourselves. You cannot work to earn your favour with God. You cannot work to earn your salvation. We cannot save ourselves. The Bible clearly states in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, that's faith in the only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is only one thing in this whole universe that can wash away your sins, and that is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians 1.14 it says, In whom we have redemption, we've been bought back, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In 1 John 1, 7 we read, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. And then 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. When John the Baptist saw the Lord Jesus Christ coming towards him, his first words he uttered were, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. In the Old Testament they've been sacrificing animals to cover up the, all their sins. In the, New Testament, in the New Testament, the shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, dies for the sheep. He loves us so much. There is only one mediator. In 1 Timothy 2.5 it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. It isn't Allah or Mary or Buddha or any other so-called God. The one mediator between man and God, God and man, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ's death, burial and resurrection. That's what the Gospel is about. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Christ is the only way. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In other words, there is no other way to have your sins forgiven, there is no other way to get to God, there is no other way to get to heaven without coming first to God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Religion cannot save you, folks. Good works cannot save you. Jesus Christ is the only one who can save you. So the question is, are you saved listening to this tape, this CD? In Acts 16 verse 31 it says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. You either die with your sins forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ, or you die in your sins. In your sins. Without him, without the Lord Jesus, there is no hope He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3.18 He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 3.36 And there's a very sombre verse in Psalm 9 verse 17 which says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God you see folks there really is a hell a literal hell friends you have everything to gain by becoming a Christian 1 Corinthians 2 9 says but as it is written I have not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him so what are you waiting for? Get saved today. Confess your sins to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask him to forgive you and become a Christian today. 
By becoming a Christian you have had every single sin dealt with, forgiven, forgotten. It will never be brought up again. Otherwise, the day of judgment is going to be your worst nightmare. And by becoming a Christian you have a place in heaven awaiting you when you die or when Christ comes back to receive his own. Whichever is first. And he is coming back. We are waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is only Christ who can bring peace to a world full of turmoil. People make so many promises. This a man's word used to be his bond. It isn't that anymore. Governments lie to us. We lie to one another. We're all the same. John 14 verse 27 says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus also says in John 16 verse 33, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And Romans 5 verse 1 we read, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You will only ever find true peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you die without Christ, you place yourself under the wrath of God and you will land up in the physical, literal, real place called hell for eternity. And once you're there, there is no escape. There's no way out. I would urge you again, come to Christ and confess your sins now, before it's too late. Now to our last question. What is the meaning of life? The purpose to it all? Well, as we have already seen, by the scriptures we've read, Jesus Christ is the central figure in the Bible, and he should be the central person in our lives. Colossians 1 verse 18 says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That's the first place. Preeminence. First place. But does he? Who are you living for? The meaning of life is to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. When you truly have this, you will know and understand what life is all about. Without Christ in your life, you and I have no hope. It doesn't matter if we make millions, live in a mansion and have great power and authority. Without Christ, we are merely existing. We do not really understand what life is about. Mark 8 verse 36 has an amazing verse. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Friend, I tell you this, it is no accident that you are listening to this tape or CD. God wants to save you. He says in 2 Peter 3 verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us would, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord Jesus Christ does not want you to go to hell. If you go there, you only have yourself to blame. You put yourself there. Repent and turn to Christ before it's too late. He loves you so much. I've heard many people say that the Bible is a book full of rules and it's boring. I tell you this, if you know the author of the Bible, you will love his word. And this book, the word of God, will become the most amazing book you have ever picked up and read. Get saved today. If you would like to ask any questions or pass on any comments, please call me or write to me. I'd be only too happy to talk with you. If this message has blessed you, why not pass it on to someone else or leave it in a place where someone else can pick it up. If you would like a free copy of my booklets, It's Your Choice, and you ask the question, again, just please call or write and I'll send you those. I pray that you too have found the truth to the deepest questions mankind has ever asked. Where did we come from? Where do we go when we die? What is the meaning of life, the purpose to it all? 
In Ephesians 4 verse 21 we read, If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. I close with the following reading from 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16 to 18. This is the next great event to happen for the Christian. It's called the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Believe it or not, I'm not expecting to die. But if I do die, and it could be today, I know that I have a place with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven in eternity. I'm waiting for the, what I've said before, the rapture. And that's where Jesus Christ is coming again very soon to take his people, the Christians, out of the earth to be with him forever. And that's why we read, wherefore comfort one another with these words. I pray that you will also be there on that day as a Christian. May God bless you. I would love to hear from you. Amen. Now because there is some space left on this cassette, um, on this tape, or this CD, whichever one you're listening to, I would also like to um, read to you a couple of passages from the scriptures and also some articles which I've written over the last couple of years. Uh, the first passage I'd like to read is 2 Timothy chapter 3 in the Holy Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and you'll see how up to date the scriptures are, even though they were written um, all those years ago. 2 Timothy 3 says this This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which, lead, which, which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You can see how up to date the Bible is, really predicting what uh, today's uh, life, our uh, society is like, written those, all those years ago. Uh, Paul is the writer there to Timothy. Uh, Timothy was saved via Paul's preaching. And he said here that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. And sadly today in our schools, uh, most schools today don't teach the holy scriptures. Uh, the Bible has been removed. 
the teaching of evolution which we've already looked at is a lie is being taught as a fact in the schools that we're just an animal or just above an animal and that you can just do as you please everything in moderation and all this kind you're master of your own destiny yet the Bible the scriptures teach that we are created by God in the image of God and that we are held responsible to him and that we should teach our young folk our youngsters our children the holy scriptures how sad it is that schools have departed from the word of God and the government and many many people in authority now no longer look to the Bible but they just look to themselves and make up um, all their teachings and just go with what their conscience says rather than um, what the scriptures teach so 2 Timothy 3 is very apt for today another passage which is a very good one to read for today's climate is 2 Peter 3 2 Peter 3 and we'll be reading uh, verses 3 to 6 2 Peter 3, 3 to 6 knowing this first that there shall come in the last days again we're living in the last days folks just before the Lord's return scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation for this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished so again scoffers in the last days are coming well you're talking about the Lord's return where, when is he going to come back you've been saying this for years and yes Christians have been saying this for years but nowhere in the period of time are we living in days like we're living in today the Jew is coming back into his nation um, the Bible is, uh, pred the predictions and the prophecies of the Bible are coming true and we are surely living in the brink of the Lord's return now there are many false religions in the world today many um, different people and different voices in the world and regarding false religions um, there's probably none greater than the religion of Roman Catholicism and I want to show you now, um, as I'm going to list uh, 22 points, where the Roman Catholics and Christianity are just north and south poles. Um, this article I wrote in a newsletter I produced uh, back in December 2001. Uh, through the work we are involved in, we come across many Roman Catholics. Oftentimes they tell us that there is no difference between their religion and ours. At a push, most Roman Catholics know very little about what their religion really teaches. I've included just a few differences for you to see and believe me, Roman Catholicism is far from being Christian or scriptural. The vast majority of the doctrines and beliefs of the Church of Rome have no basis whatsoever in the scriptures. Below is a list of unscriptural doctrines and the dates on which they were made official. I've included just a few scriptures to help you see how contrary their beliefs are to the Bible and the scriptures I'm going to list you'll obviously have to look those up and again in an authorised version Bible if you can number one the daily mass was adopted in 394 AD and the scriptures that are contrary to this you'd have to read would be Hebrews 9 verse 22 to 28 and Hebrews 10 verse 10 to 18 number two the doctrine of purgatory we've already mentioned it on this um, tape or CD Pope Gregory brought this in in 539 AD a man made doctrine as all these are read the scriptures Luke 23 43 and John 3 36 number 3 prayers to the Virgin Mary the Queen of Heaven 600 AD that was brought in read the scriptures Matthew 6 verse 9 Luke 11 verse 2 and Psalm 51 nowhere in the Bible are we told to pray to the Virgin Mary the, and she is certainly not the Queen of Heaven Number four, the first Pope, Boniface um, the third, 610 AD. Um, popes are nowhere mentioned in the scriptures. Read Mark 1 verse 30. Um, elders, bishops and deacons are, but no popes. Um, again, man-made. Number five, kissing the Pope's foot began in 709 AD. Read the scriptures, Psalm 2 verse 12. Number six, worship of images, relics and cross, 788. AD again nowhere in the scriptures is that found read the scriptures Exodus 20 verse 4 Exodus 34 verse 13 to 17 most Roman Catholics won't um, realize this but most of these if not all of these are man-made doctrines 
brought in by a church through superstition and tradition which they've put above the word of God number six worship of I'm um, sorry we said that number seven holy water blessed by a priest in 850 AD um, there's only three things that are mentioned in the scripture that are holy you'll find those in the New Testament None, not one of them is holy water no such thing number eight the canonization of dead saints Pope John the 15th in 995 AD read the scriptures Acts 10 verse 25 and 26 and Luke 4 verse 8 the mass declared to be a sacrifice of Christ 1050 AD that's number 9 again you want to read Hebrews 10 verse 18 number 10 celibacy of the priesthood and nuns 1079 AD you want to read in the authorised version bible 1 Timothy 3 verse 1 to 2 Titus 1 verse 5 and 6 and Mark 1 verse 30 number 11 the rosary the beads introduced by Peter the hermit in 1090 AD you want to read the scriptures Matthew 6 verse 6 there's no beads number 12 selling indulgences began in 1190 AD you want to read the scriptures 1 John 1 verse 7 and Romans 3 verse 23 to 25 I don't recommend many films to watch by the way folks but one film I would definitely recommend is getting the original um, film of Martin Luther the German monk and um, that is such an accurate uh, film and it has a good documentary after it so if you can get hold of that Martin Luther the original um, Niles McGuinness is the actor who plays in the film if that's any help number 13 doctrine of transubstantiation adopted in 1215 AD you want to read the scriptures 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23 to 26 all these doctrines are false confessions of sins confession of sins to a human priest in 1215 AD the Bible says you are not to confess your sins to one another you are to confess your sins to Christ it is only God who can forgive your sins Mark 2 7 1 Timothy 2 5 1 John 1 verse 9 I certainly am not going to sit in a confessional and confess my sins to another sinner and the Pope is a sinner, Mother Teresa is a sinner, Mary was a sinner. There is only one person that's ever walked the course of this earth who was not a sinner, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. We confess our sins only to him. You cannot get saved by confessing your sins to anybody but Christ. Number 15, the interpretation of, Bible, of the Bible forbidden to the laity, 1229 A.D., we are told that we are to read the scriptures you've already read um, or have read to you regarding Timothy that he knew the scriptures as a, as a child 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 read and 1 Corinthians 2 verse 7 to 13 number 16 seven sacraments declared that was brought in in 1439 AD again you want to read Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 it's not by sacraments or works that we're saved so again that is man made you want to read Titus 3 verse 5 to 7 and Romans 4 verse 5 number 17 tradition established as infallible authority so they put in tradition um, on par or sometimes above the word of God which is brought in in 1545 AD and again if you read Mark 7 verse 3 to 13 and Galatians 1 14 and 15 that will clear that up for you number 18 the apocryphal books added to the Bible they've added I think it's 14 extra books the Roman Catholics have to the Bible hence why they have very strange doctrines in 1546 they were added AD read the scriptures Deuteronomy 4.2 Revelation 22 verse 18 and 19 we are told not to add to the word of God number 19 the immaculate conception of the Virgin Mary in 1854 uh, you want to read um, Romans 3.23 Luke 1 verse 46 and 47 and 2 verse 24 Mary was a sinner she said it herself number 20 the infallibility of the popes in 1870 AD you want to read the scriptures Matthew 23 verse 9 Romans 3 verse 4 Romans 3 verse 23 the popes are not infallible many times they've contradicted themselves um, like I said we want to put all our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone number 21 Mary declared to be the mother of God that's blasphemy 1931 AD that was read the scriptures 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 and John 19 verse 26 and the assumption or the translation of the Virgin Mary our last point um, that was instigated in 1950 
uh, you want to, well again, I say read the scriptures, find where that is in the scriptures where she was translated, which is um, again an error of the Roman Catholic Church. So these are just um, some of the errors they've uh, introduced over time. The Roman Catholics, again, to suit themselves, it is a false religion. Um, I'm just trying to get you to believe the Bible. The Bible is the word of God, written by God, promised. Uh, he promised to preserve it from this generation and forever. You can read about that in Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7. And uh, we put our faith and trust in the word of God and in the Lord Jesus Christ. For other interesting articles, please turn over this um, tape, um, if you're listening on tape that is, we'll continue on the CD and um, there will be some more articles to come. Love. What is love? The Bible says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to, to be the propitiation for our sins. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. C.T. Studd, the famous cricket player who became a missionary, said, If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. Jesus Christ lived and died for us in order to provide a way back to God. Yet sadly to say the majority of the world want nothing to do with him. I pray you are not like this. I'd now like to read to you a uh, chapter or a couple of um, pages from my book that you asked the question on why is Christianity the only way? Do not all religions lead to God? In John 14, verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is speaking here, and he says that unless you come to him, there is no way to God. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, 5. Think about all the religions in the world. They all profess to know the way to God, and yet instead of coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, they all take some other route, trying to get to God. They preach a false gospel. The Apostle Paul said in the Scriptures, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul defines what the gospel is in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So once again we come back to the Holy Scriptures, for they tell us who God is, and the way to him. Religion has saved no one, ever. Instead, it has led millions to separation from God in hell. We note here the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Jesus Christ is alive today and he is seated at the right hand of his Father in heaven. As we have mentioned previously, being religious and doing good works cannot bring us into a right relationship with Almighty God. Self-righteousness is a stench in God's nostrils. For we read in Isaiah 64, verse 6 and 7, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us, 
because of our iniquities. Christianity teaches we are accepted by God if we are solely trusting in Jesus Christ as our sacrificial substitute. In other words, Jesus paid the price for our sins. There is nothing that we can do to earn favour with God. Jesus took our punishment upon himself and suffered and died in our place. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12 Whatever religion, cult or organisation someone is in, they can never be accepted by God if they do not come to the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.5 in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1 verse 7 You cannot get saved, you cannot have your sins forgiven without coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There are many people that profess to be Christians, yet they have not come to Christ. We are all sinners, and the only way we can have our sins cleansed is by the blood of Jesus Christ. Think about it. If good works can save us, if religion can save us, why did Jesus die? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. That's John 3, verse 16 to 18, and verse 36. What is the point of believing in God? I've got better things to do. How many times have I heard that? Or trying to witness to somebody, trying to preach to somebody or talk to somebody about the Lord. I've got better things to do. I'm not interested in God. But whether you believe it or not, one day you are going to meet God face to face. You're going to be judged by Him. We've looked at that already. One day the listener to this tape or this CD will meet the Lord Jesus Christ face to face, alone. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after the judgment, you're going to stand before God. Nobody to help you, no solicitor or barrister, you're alone on that day to defend yourself. And you have no defence if you have not accepted Christ as your Saviour. After we die, there is a judgment we're told. In Acts 24 verse 15 it says that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust we will spend eternity somewhere. There's no such thing as reincarnation or um, that you just, you annihilated like so many cults say, like the Jehovah's Witnesses or Christadelphians. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. Death is not the end. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Every person that is living or has ever lived will be judged by Jesus Christ. The hardest criminal and the sweetest, kindest person will both be judged by Jesus himself. No one can escape this judgment and there will be no misjudgment. What will be done will be perfectly fair. On that day when you meet God, you will have to give account of your life to him. In Romans 14:12 it says so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God 
The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.10 For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20 Nothing will be hid. All will be laid naked and open. Every sin will be revealed. Every wrong and lustful thought will be called back, brought back to remembrance and judged accordingly by God's perfect justice and holiness. In Hebrews 4 verse 12 to 13 we read, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that should come abroad. Mark 4.22 But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Matthew 12 verse 36 O God, thou knowest my foolishness and my sins are not hid from thee Psalm 69 verse 5 You see, sin must be punished For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness That's Romans 1 verse 18 For the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.23 Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. That's Galatians 6, verse 7 to 8. Take heed of this warning. If your name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life, you will go to hell forever and once you are there there is no way of escaping it's too late to turn to God then but there is a way to escape from going to hell now the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long suffering to us would not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance 2 Peter 3 9 Jesus does not want anyone to perish in hell. He wants us all to turn to him for forgiveness. But if we continue to reject him and go our own way and live our lives the way we want to rather than God's way, then we are choosing our own destination. The greatest love story ever is Jesus Christ dying for mankind so we can have our sins forgiven. But he will never force himself upon us. He wants us to love him willingly. In John 3.3 3, we, we read, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. God. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That's Isaiah 1 verse 18. There is a way to be saved. There is a way to have our sins forgiven. Blood must be shed for sins to be forgiven. For though thou wash me with nitre, that's a powerful cleanser, and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. Jeremiah 2.22 Without shedding of blood is no remission. Hebrews 9.22 It is the blood that maketh an atonement, and atonement means disannul, pacify, reconcile the soul back to God or restore. It is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Leviticus 17.11 and then that great verse in Colossians 1.14 in whom we have redemption we're brought back through his blood even the forgiveness of sins Jesus became our sacrifice and gave his life to save us and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary there they crucified him and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice he said Father into thy hands I commend my spirit and having said thus he gave up the ghost Luke 23 verse 33 and 46 God gave his son the Lord Jesus Christ to die for you and for me he that believeth on the son of God hath the witness in himself he that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his son he that hath the son hath life 
and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5 verse 10 to 12 I do hope you can now see the importance of not only believing in God but also committing your life to him. He loves you so much. In John 10 verse 9 and 10 it says, I am the door, Jesus speaking. I am the door, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Matthew 11 verse 28 to 30 says, Come unto me, again Jesus speaking, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Two more passages of scripture I'd like to read to you now is one um, in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, and the other will be 1 Thessalonians 5. Ephesians 2 says this, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were, were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him, as the Lord Jesus Christ, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And 1 Thessalonians 5 says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep we should live together with him. Wherefore comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. 
what is sin? Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Five definitions of sin in the New Testament are as follows. The one I've just read to you, whosoever, trans whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, is lawlessness, breaking the law. To break any law of God or man is sin. In Romans 13 we read, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armour of light. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfil the lusts thereof. So breaking God's law is sin. Neglect is sin. We read in James 4, James 4 verse 17, these words. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Sin. Neglect is sin. Doubt is sin. In Romans 14 verse 23, we read, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So if you doubt God's word, or you doubt what God says, it's sin. God has written us a book, you and me. He's given it to us to read, to study, to learn, to bring us closer to him. To understand what he wants. He knows what's best for us. And if you're doubting God's word, it's sin. Unbelief is sin. In John chapter 16, John chapter 16, verse 8 and 9, we read these words. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Unbelief is sin. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me, the Lord Jesus Christ said. And all unrighteousness is sin. In 1 John 5, verse 17, we read this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. And pride, I've added another one here, because pride, you can sin, you, we could talk about sin all day, there's so many, but just to give you the, um, the, the, I say the big ones, the most common ones, um, pride is sin. In Proverbs 21, 
Proverbs 21 and again if you're not a Christian and you're going your own way to a certain extent you've set yourself up as God rather than um, submitting to God you rule your own life you choose and do your own things and you will not submit to an authority especially not God Proverbs 21 verse 4 says an high look and a proud heart and the ploughing of the wicked is sin Proverbs is an amazing book as they all are but Proverbs especially regarding um, wisdom uh, in Proverbs 6 verse 16 it says these six things doth the Lord hate yea seven of an abomination unto him listen to this a proud look are you proud? Am I proud? A lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood. God hates these. And heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among brethren. David, the greatest king of all Israel, he sinned like everyone like I said the only person that hasn't sinned is the Lord Jesus Christ and why I like the Bible so much is because it's honest and the account of David when he sinned he, co he committed um, lust and fornication and murder to cover up his first sins he wrote Psalm 51 listen to this a broken man have mercy upon me O God according to thy loving kindness according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies blot out my transgressions wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me is that like you and me? do we acknowledge our transgressions? against thee thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. He was a broken man. He knew he'd sinned against God and he got on his hands and knees and he prayed this prayer. In Psalm 38 we read something similar. Again, we're all sinners. We need to come before God and confess our sins and ask him to forgive us of our sins. Psalm 38 says, O Lord, again a psalm of David, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head, as an heavy burden they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled, I am bowed down greatly, I go mourning all the day long. Do you care about your sins? David did. The trouble is today, we've seared our conscience we burnt our conscience out so we just don't fear God anymore we don't care about our sins but David did he knew what life was about he goes on to say in verse 8 I am feeble and sore broken I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart Lord all my desire is before thee and my groaning is not hid from thee my heart panteth my strength faileth me as for the light of mine eyes it also is gone from me my lovers and my friends stand aloof from me, from my sore, and my kinsmen stand afar off. They also that seek after my life lay snares for me, and they that seek my hurts speak mischievous things and imagine deceits all the day long. But I as a deaf man heard not, and I was as a dumb man that openeth not his mouth. 
Thus I was as a man that heareth not, and in whose mouth are no reproofs. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou wilt hear, O Lord, my God. For I said, Hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slippeth, they magnify themselves against me. For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare mine iniquity, I will be sorry for my sin. Are you sorry for your sins? But mine, in, but mine enemies are lively, and they are strong, and they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. They also that render evil for good are mine adversaries, because I follow the thing that good is. Forsake me not, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. David was a man that was broken by sinning against God. He loved God so much, he realised he'd let him down and hurt him. He was sorry for his sin. We need to be sorry for our sins. The Bible says that there are open sins, which obviously we can see, and we've discussed some of those. And there are also secret sins. Now Psalm 90 verse 8 says, Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. You see, God sees all sin. God sees all sin. In Proverbs 15.3 it says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. At night time when you shut your doors and you, everybody goes into their own houses and does their own thing, there's secret sins going on even there. God sees everything. We can hide things from our loved ones. We can hide from each other. But you cannot hide from God. He sees everything. I hope you've enjoyed this talk on life and some of its issues. May God bless you. And I hope to hear from you soon. Amen.